Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Books. Uh, we're doing another remote session from uh, an artist studio today. The artist is Cheryl Ryan Harshman. Everybody knows her. She's a wheeling uh, celebrity, let's say. She's a writer and uh, also a great visual artist. And today she's going to take you around her studio and show you how she makes art. Here is Cheryl Ryan Harshman. Hi, Sean. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my studio, my glorious studio. Behind me, you can see the furnace and the hot water heater. So obviously being an artist in wheeling is very glamorous. Uh, the process that I do down here, uh, you may see from my apron, is also very glamorous and muddy, it's very muddy. Today we're going to do some clay mono printing and the clay mono prints have been successful in getting me into some juried shows. So um, I'm going to show you the process. It's a different kind of printmaking. And um, I learned it from a man named Mitch Lyons, who's gone on to uh, where all good potters and printmakers go. Uh, and, and thanks to Bob Villa Magna, who brought him to West Liberty to teach us about clay printing. It truly changed my life. I'm going to start by showing you how I set up printmaking with clay. It's a very uh, elemental kind of process. The cavemen used it in the, in the caves in France, and it's just clay, good old clay from the earth, and water, clay and water. Pretty simple to start with. I make a board out of plywood or some kind of junk wood that I have around. I make sure that there is a plastic covering because this is a process about water. So something to keep the water, the moisture from going into that board and rotting it. And then a very very thin quarter of an inch board around. Uh, I've used uh, yardsticks for the, the bigger piece I'm going to show you later. Something to keep the clay from sliding off the board. So this is this is how I start. And I fill that board with clay, some kind of stoneware uh, that's used to make pots and put that down. And the clay needs to dry to um, leather hard, they call it. So it's not really moist, it's not really juicy and wet clay like you make a pot with, but it's uh, somewhat dry, not completely, but somewhat dry. That's the base. Now, to make an image on that base, I do a little bit more than what the cavemen did with their hands and colored clay. I am going to make colored clay, but um, if you know me, you know I like bright colors. So uh, I'm going to add some bright colors, like maybe this is a yellow or a red and so forth. And, and to do that, I start with something called white kale and clay. It's a china clay, a white, and it's a powder. And because I was a cook long before I was printmaker, I, I sometimes think about this in terms of uh, kitchen and cooking processes. So this is this step is a bit like making frosting for cookies. You start with this white powder. Don't eat it, but it's sort of like powdered sugar. And you add water to the dry. And you get, I don't know if Aaron wants to show this or not. But you get a, a white slip, a muck, white slip. It's uh, just water and the white clay. And this white clay then I put into little, little jars and I add pigment. This is pure pigment. This is not ink. This is not paint. It's pure pigment, which means that there's no plastic. You no know, plastic in here, like an acrylic paint, to uh, to be a binder, to be a glue. There's no oil in it, like an oil uh, paint. This is 
pure pigment is like when you go to the hardware store to get some paint to paint your wall or to paint some furniture and they start with a base that's what this was a base and then they they squirt some colors in there and they mix it up so the colors that they squirt in there in that base that's the pure pigment so i've made up a few to, to show as samples um there's the orange got a bright yellow and got a gray now because i'm working with what color was this white everything is mixed with white so this bright orange became a salmon and this dark ivory black became lovely gray. So I have to know a little bit about that when I mix up the colors, that they're not gonna be true to what was in the bottle unless I add lots and lots and lots of color. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the, um, the board. I'm gonna twist this a little bit. This is the big board. Um, this past winter, bef before COVID, I built a new board because after 20 years, the other one gave away. So I used a um, piece of wood that a dear friend found and cut for me, 36 inches. I used a piece of plastic from a uh, bathroom repair job for the walls of, of a tub. So that's my plastic layer. I've got four yardsticks, so I know this is exactly 36 inches on each side. And I filled it with 50 pounds of that brown clay. So 50 pounds of brown clay. And then I used the white to make, like we all start with uh, when we draw on color, white page. So this part here is just plain white. Hey, Chris, nice to see you. Hi, Janet, thanks for turning in, tuning in. Um, so this is something, this is, I can now make a new image. I can new, make a new start. This bit over here is what was left from the last print that I made. So one of the reasons I like this is you don't really have to clean up. You just pile more, more clay, more stuff on top of the old image. And that makes for interesting archaeology digging back months or prints later. But, um, it, it means that I, I don't have to throw everything away and start again. So I have some old under this part of the white, and this is covering up everything. Now, because I knew you were coming to visit, I started an image on the other side, this yellow. I decided to make some stripes. So uh, let's see, where's the pink? Here's one. We'll pull this off. You can see that I've got some stripes going. Come in. Studio assistant today is Aaron. That's really icky. Oh, thank you. So I've used some paper to make stripes for you to see. I'm going to come around, Aaron, to that side. We'll pull up some more of this uh, tape. This is um, come to the roll. Some of you might recognize this. This is drywall tape. Now, drywall tape is just paper. There's no glue, there's no adhesive. And what makes it stick to the chipboard as well as to um, your wall when you're doing some mud work, mud work on the wall is the water and the clay. I'll pull up some more of these little stripes. You see, um, all this yellow is clay. I've just painted over it. I painted the clay over it so that some clay is still sticking. And then the rest of it, you can see maybe some blue peeking through. That's the oil. That's what was under there originally. So I've got uh, several generations going on. And I'm not sure if you can see, but this stripe 
has some clay that's uh, standing up. So in that case, everything has to be smooth and embedded into, into the board, into the clay board. So I'm gonna put some newsprint over top. My high tech tool is called a pizza roller. I'm gonna push, push down some newsprint to embed that clay, that wet, wet clay. Um, why the newspaper? Because it absorbs the extra moisture from the clay and it acts like a blotter. So then when I pull this off, yes, yeah, some of it comes up, but it also, I've got some nice texture going on there too. So uh, that every, every little bit of color that goes onto the slab of clay as I'm making an image has to be rolled in. It has to be made nice and flat and um, even. This is not about uh, gouging or building up. Everything has to be absolutely two-dimensional when you go to print it. That. Now, remember I said there was a lot of yellow left here? Linda, Linda from Akron. Hi, darling. I'm going to put some, some of that back on to show you that uh, it's we never waste anything in art. So, again, I'm going to get the, the newsprint and I'm going to roll it. Let's see, let's get it to the inside here. Roll that, those pieces in that we, before we throw them away, I might as well get a little clay from them. A lot of this process is very improvisational. So there, I've got two more stripes going another way. And I've also put some uh, paper down before you came, so I'd at least have a nice straight line there. Okay. Now there's some other ways of putting color on the clay slab. And, um, here's that pretty salmon and the gray. Now, uh, I'm not sure how much you can see here, but um, there's still a, if it's kind of shiny, that means it's kind of wet. And if it's very dry, that means it's too dry. And so, I'm gonna spritz it with water. This is all a process about plants and water. And now I'm going to embed these colors into that white spot. There, uh, and there are lots of different ways of doing that. So let me start by, uh, I'm going to use some of the gray. And I'm going to put it in this right over the oh, right over that yellow I just put down. And I'm going to use a sharp tool. In this case, it's just the end of a spoon. And I'm going to make marks through it. Anybody remember mimeograph sheets and how you could um, put the inky purple side down and and mark through it. Well, that's sort of what I've just done here. Being able to see that, Sean? Some black lines in the yellow. And some black lines, particularly yellow and the black for you. Okay, so that's one way. Uh, and then, of course, what did I say earlier? We have to embed all that. So I'll put the paper down on the pizza roller. Roll that, those black lines in so they don't come off so that they're, there we go. Interesting black lines. But then another thing that we can do besides just uh, scraping off Mimeo style, we can put these two pages together, the black and the orange, uh, because today's the first day of fall. And, and think of some fall colors here, orange and flat. Oh, golly. I love making a mess. So here's the black and the uh, orange. 
and I'm going to mush them together again. And yes, I'm going to smear those two nice colors together. Let's see what we have when we tear the paper apart. Oh, we have some Rothko. Some Rothko going on. Okay, I'm going to go around to the other side because I'm so sure I have a hard time reaching. Okay, now let's do our Rothko desk. Images here. We'll go this way. And I don't know which way should we go here, this way. Uh, with this kind of art, there's no right way. There's no wrong way. It's, so because it's so uh, improv, and full of improv and intuition, uh, you have to. You sort of sometimes uh, you just have to go with the flow. You just have to uh, go with the uh, imperfections or the surprises that come in this printing process. Yes, you can also have an idea of what you want. I often have an idea of what I want to make and then, uh, oh Lordy, it's not really how I want it to turn out. Okay, so this is just dry paper here. I'm pushing in the color. Let's see what, I, let's see what we got. Okay, here comes the orange. That ought to be easier for you to see. And there's still a lot left on the paper. I'm going to do that one one more time. And I don't really care about putting it back and registering it. I'm just going to try and get some more of that pretty salmon color onto my print. That's fine. Do my time. Okay. Okay. A little bit more came off. So maybe you're understanding why I do this in the basement instead of in the bedroom or even in the kitchen. It's clay and it's water. And then there's this soppy old newsprint. And, uh, and that's why I also wear my finest clothes. Print in. Okay, there's some of the black. Let's move. Let's so get some of that black up here into, into the book. Orange. Okay. Now, this uh, printing process takes a long time to build up layer after layer after layer. And I'm not even ready to say, oh, let's uh, make a picture. Let's, let's put a dog on here or a horse. Because I have, I'm showing you lots of different techniques for putting the colors together. And, um, the images might come tomorrow or the next day. Don't worry, you don't have to stay that long. Okay, so some of the ways that I like to do immediate color, I'm all about immediate gratification, is uh, to use stencils. This is a, a plastic stencil with uh, swirlies on it. I'm gonna do it down here on the over the black and white, I think. And as I said, this process is all about water and mud. Hold on, I'm missing a tool. Okay, so uh, at high tech, I did tell you it was high tech, didn't I? So here's my kitchen strainer. And I have some chalk pastels because a chalk pastel is just clay without the water. So this is nice and damp underneath because I just put the white down today. So I'm going to just grate some, some different colors onto this stencil. There's a turquoise. I thought maybe that would go with the salmon color. And salmon uh, pastel as well. Let's get one other color. Oh, here's kind of a greeny color. 
Whoa. Pushed so hard, I wore out my, my strainer just there. Okay. Now, that's very, very dry clay. You have to mist it just a little bit and from a distance because uh, I don't want to make a puddle and have it run away. I want just a little bit to fold it. I take the plastic off. Let's see what kind of mess I've made. There we go. I don't know if you can see that or not. I'm also going to turn it upside down. I think I'll do that over some of that yellow just to see. Huh. What if? What if? And then, of course, the newsprint. And the pizza roller. And we'll pull that off. And hmm, that made an image too. I had lots and lots of uh, powder on there, uh, the dry powder. So that took nicely. And sometimes this is just going to be background. So maybe if we're going to put a black dog, for example, on this, he'll pop out and these things will be behind him. So we're doing the background of the print. I'll do, uh, Let's, see, let's just do one more. This is her uh, underlayment from a carpet. And um, put it over here on this white surface. And I just pulled out different kinds of crayons, uh, the chalk pastel. So we'll just do a little bit more. This is a deep purple. Little spritz of water. And because the first one was so exciting, let's do that again. Go. Okay. Something that uh, an artist, a graphic, person uh, remember is repetition, putting some of the same things in over and over again in a painting, or in, in this case, a print. So I've got some stripes, some vertical lines. I've got these little uh, grids back and forth. They're similar, but they're different because they're reversed. And the same with the curly cues. Uh, so that's starting to look kind of interesting. I hope you can see some of this from, uh, from your screen. Uh, it's not ready to print because I would like to do lots more, but we are thinking about time. And there are other things to show you, like how these actually turn out. So I want to tell you a little bit about how I print it. I use something called Remay, R-E-E-M-A-Y. And it's a polyester non-woven fiber or fabric. Um, you can do it on paper. Um, you can do it on sandpaper, uh, but uh, this seemed, or Pellon, Pellon from Joanne's Fabrics, for example. Um, but this works really well because uh, it, it helps us get um, electrostatic, that's the word I'm looking for, an electrostatic charge that's going to keep that clay on this fiber permanently. I usually roll it, let's see, can you see? No, we're just out of, I have, I buy it in the roll. A couple hundred yards. And uh, that's where I keep it hanging up there so it's out of the way and stays clean. It's still, it's uh, rolling like a canvas that you paint on, but it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't give like woven fabric does. So it stays pretty much where it is. Uh, the elect help, electric magnetic charge helps keep it stuck to the clay. So if you're familiar with printmaking, you might remember that things have to be registered. Um, 
they have to hold still. And so the clay and the water is going to do that for us. And also um, this remay. Remay is used in a lot of industrial um, areas, for example, heating and air conditioning ductwork. This is a filter paper. Milk parlors. I don't know if there's anybody watching today that knows what a milk parlor is. No, you don't go there to get a milkshake. Um, this is also used as a, a filter in those sorts of situations. And um, to make the static electric charge, I'm going to print something that's here so we can see it. Um, you need to take this dry fiber and make it compatible to the to the clay. So I'm going to spritz it lightly. If I was serious about making a nice clean uh, print, I would get some more of that uh, tape that you use for um, for mudding your walls, and I would put that around and make a nice um, a nice border. But we don't have time for that today, so I'm going to put this down, and I'm going to clean my hands, kind of, sort of. Off. Again, this was for a real print. Lots of soap and water. Because I don't want the uh, clay that's on my hands or that water to uh, ruin this beautiful print that might go to a gallery or a show. Okay, I've got that. Also, I would have cleaned off or used a clean. I've got another pizza roller. Nice clean pizza roller. And then we start in. Start and this is where we get to have our exercise, a little upper body strength. Sean, are you having fun yet? Yes. Good. I just wanted to show you weren't asleep. I'm but watching. Had, I'm going to be sure you hadn't gone to lunch yet. I'm still here. Fascinating. Fascinating. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, partially printed. And I always, uh, this is really how Cheryl works. I, I'm looking for a spoon. Another high tech instrument in printing. And, um, that's sarcasm. So I'll go over this a little bit more with my spoon because the heat from, this is an old uh, antique silver spoon, and the heat from me rubbing with this piece of metal on this makes the static cling. You know, Swiffer, there's a static cling, a static charge, electromagnetic charge. Okay, we're gonna see what this looks like. Okay, there's the orange coming up. Yeah, you can see that. You can see some of the curlicues unfolding. Some black underneath, some of the purple here in the corner. Okay, I'm going to say, oh, no, I want, to, I want to do a little more, a little more definition. And I can just pop it down, and it's registered. In real printmaking, you have to have pins. We have to be careful. And, hmm. Well, if you know Cheryl, she's not. Not that careful. So um, I'm going to go back again with the spoon because it's been it's registered because it was still sticking in the clay. I'm going to uh, move my spoon back and forth. My my uh, fingers are getting very hot. That would be the electricity, the electrostatic charge, and I'm going to go over the places that I didn't didn't hit very well with the pizza roller, the pizza roller being wooden, uh, it does push the fiber into the clay, but it doesn't build up that electromagnetic charge. Okay. All right, let's try this again. Now, this is a sample, this is not a real piece. I'm going to go ahead and pull it. Uh, if I were doing this uh, as a real print, I would pull it back this way, and I pull it this way, about halfway, each way, 
to see mm, what kind of colors am I getting? Ooh, that green could be better. How about here? Well, that's looking, if, if the print looks about the same color as the clay, that's successful, that's done. Okay, here we go. Here's our clay print. So you can see the whirly swirlies and you can see some of the uh, grid, see the different colors. And that's a sample. Now, what happens when we go have lunch and come back? What happens to that clay? Right. And the clay dries. The clay dries. This is clay that I painted on the paper yesterday. This is what happens, right? Oh no, my clay print is dried, it's ruined. Well, uh, there's one step that I do when it is dry. And because I'm in the basement, I have a clothesline down here. Anybody remember clotheslines? I have clothes pins. So I hang this up and I let it dry. And um, uh, and then when it's dry, I take it outside, hopefully. Sometimes I have to do this here in the basement on a cold winter day. But I get something called Thompson's Water Seal. Thompson's Water Seal that you put on decks to save the wood. Um, I put it in a bottle, like the water bottle, and I spritz the print with this oil and all the dry clay which does hopefully does not uh flake off like that the beautiful dark color comes back kind of like this here's another one let's try this one so the thompson's water seal would do that so the original colors come back and it makes it archival it makes it permanent it it makes sure that that clay that will not dry and dissipate. And um, I have some clay, uh, clay prints to show you today, uh, to show you that they didn't dry up, they didn't blow away. Uh, although some might wish that my, my art would dry up and blow away, but, uh, but I know you won't tell me that. So Aaron's gonna try and help me show you some of the pieces that I have around the, my studio, my fancy studio, and we'll talk about them. And it, the ride may be a little bumpy. Hang in there. So, this is one that's freshly done. And um, I put the clay on a canvas. Can you hear the canvas? To see if I can get, a, I'm trying to get away. Neil Warren, I hope you're not listening. From, and the glass because there's something about this process that makes you want to touch the art. And in my case, I really don't mind if people touch the art because it's just mud, isn't it? Um, so I'm trying out something new there. Um, the things I write about myself and my art that I paint and I sew and I print and sometimes all at the same time. And that's the case. Uh, with the little horse here. This is all clay print, but uh, the background that I made, uh, the houses and so forth that I thought I was making, remember I said it's you can't do a lot of uh, detail work. It They didn't turn out. So then I got another piece of clay print and I put it through the sewing machine because it's just fabric, it's just fiber to me. So I made a little horse with his tail and his, his mane and they stick up. I don't know if you can see it very well here, but there's a bit of a three-dimensional look there. Put them in some old barn wood. What should we look at next? Oh, here's another one. I guess since you're right here, Aaron. Because the background is pretty about open, it didn't have a silver thing, it didn't say anything. So I cut out some other pieces and zigzagged them, and I call it the flying boxcar. I wonder who remembers what a flying boxcar is. 
My dad always talked about them, so that's what he took the cat. Well, this is the first one I ever did. Uh, I could bring it to you. Want to bring it to you? This is one I did with with Mitch Lyons. So that's, yeah, that's a little better. Mitch Lyons, the man who invented the process, and uh, it was also the first one, the first thing I ever made that got into a juried exhibition, uh, the West Virginia Biennial. So what else should we show, Mary? Yeah, the, the, the COVID quartet. Let me talk to you about the COVID quartet. I'll talk and I'll let Aaron show them to you. Now, it's, it's been quite a year, hasn't it? Yeah, that was pretty good. Um, last year was even bigger for me. I lost my mother. I retired from my career. And I started another full-time, very, very busy job. And uh, I didn't know if I'd ever be able to do art again because I was, I was exhausted. I was depleted. And then I found out I needed a heart operation. And we also all learned about COVID. And then I was pretty sure I'd never paint or make this clay mess again. Um, but I'd been to... Uh, Huntington Art Museum in Huntington, West Virginia, and I'd met a printmaker there who made really messy prints, not out of clay, but out of some other things, and hers were eight by ten feet, uh, and I thought, oh, I'd like to do something like that, and then I realized if I was going to do it, I better get started before I had to go to the hospital and before who knows what COVID was going to do to us, so facing maybe my own mortality, I started on these prints. This is what I call the COVID quartet. And each one is separate, and, but like in a piece of music, uh, each movement uh, relates to one another. The first one on this side, I call malaise. Malaise because that's how we were feeling in March and April, weren't we? Malaise. We were all pretty blue and, and all maybe reckoning with our mortality and what, what would our futures be? The next one I call the COVID angel. And she's black. And is she black because she's the angel of death? Or is she black because she is the angel who's fighting this terrible COVID? That's your choice. That's the viewer's choice. Um, I also have, uh, maybe you can see, can I use some stencils here? Uh, their numbers and letters, it's not for any reason, they don't spell anything, but they are in a cruciform. Um, and maybe maybe that sort of energy needed to come into this, uh, this hopeless situation. The next one is about broken hearts, uh, ripped apart hearts. Uh, maybe it's the people who've been experiencing COVID and those of us who've lost um, it starts with well, these are two pieces that I, that I made, and I eventually sewed them together on the sewing machine. There's a zigzag, you can look at it closely. The red circle, you saw another one here with the red circle. Um, that in Japanese uh, art, that is a circle of wholeness, serenity, of peace, and um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, you would turn the laptop a little to the right so that we can hear what Cheryl's saying. Just turn it the, toward her. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, the sound. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Yeah, we've moved to another room, and so we may be uh, moving in and out of wireless connection, too. Um, so during this time of COVID, I know I was looking for some peace and wholeness. And um, and yet, I, as I was making this, I was thinking about my heart that was going to be repaired and um, opened. And uh, 
so not just the physical part of opening a heart, but the the of metaphysical uh, thoughts about opening a heart. I put it back together with staples, a staple gun. This is right on a wooden board. I'm oh, not gonna. So this is a this is a two inch wooden uh, piece. Of To me, this was uh, representative of sutures. The last one uh, is called piecing it together. Oh, I have to right. I have to be in front of the mic. Uh, piecing it together. Uh, there I am, I'm back. And this piecing it together is also uh, representative of quilting. And there's a, those of you who know quilting know that there's a square, an individual square in the quilts called the log cabin quilt. And the log cabin quilt uh, was a very simple one that our predecessors and ancestors made. Starts with one square in the center and then small rectangle squares around it to make a block, to make a block for the quilt. And then, you know, a couple dozen of those squares to make the quilt. Usually and traditionally, the middle square was red. And it was red to symbolize the hearth, the center of the home. So I did this in a 2020 COVID kind of way. The center square is reddish. It's hot pink and magenta. It's in the red family. It symbolize our home. And then there are smaller rectangles around it. And uh, again, I grew them, but I also stapled these pieces on the board. In this case, not for sutures, but for the hand stitching that was brought into the mud cabin school. So, this is where I do paint, and you maybe see some dribbles. I'm going to actually throw the paint down here and um, face where I keep my paint. And a little bit of light that I do get down here in the basement. Yeah, we're having a hard time hearing you when you stand on that side. How about now? Yeah, when you stand in front, it's better. I'm sorry. That's okay. There you go. Uh, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to the people who are listening. Um, anybody have questions or comments? Yeah. My COVID quartet is fascinating. Do you have any plans of continuing the series? Well, yeah, maybe. I've got the, thank you for that question. I've got the board, that 36 inch board primed and it's wet. You know, if I don't use it for a while, it dries out here, even in my basement. So it's nice and juicy. I've got some new paints that I was showing you and demonstrating. And um, yeah, that's this, you're right. The first four COVID pieces are from those first few months that were so, but not devastating maybe, but really hard and confusing for us. So yeah, maybe I should think about some more COVID pieces. I'm definitely, I definitely like working in this big size. I've got plenty of reme, I've got plenty of clay, and I've got another wooden board. So I should tell you uh, that the angel is going this weekend to Tamarack. It was juried into the Best of West Virginia show. Hi, Becky. And uh, that means that um, I'm going to be there with the big players. Uh, you know, the Fensels and the Villa Magnus from up here, as well as folks from all over the state. The, uh, the quilt, piecing it together, has been purchased by uh, a collector here in Wheeling. And so I think maybe some more quilt pieces. Uh, could be made. 
let me show you how I make the quilt pieces. Yeah. So in my drawer, I have one that has all the creole prints because in this process, they don't all fall together. And you saw that that first one was, yeah, I don't know if I'd want to hang it or not. So Maybe turn it towards Carol just a little bit. Oh, sorry. sorry. There uh, we go. Perfect. Better? Perfect. Yep. So I have a drawer full of uh, scraps uh, or things that didn't turn out. Or, uh, and so to the to the woman who's the sewer, the seamstress, the quilt maker, these are all pieces for me to put through the sewing machine again. So these are all the failed things. And I think I could very easily uh, make some more pieced ones. And I could also make some smaller ones that would fit in a home better. So Elizabeth, thank you for asking that. Anybody else have some questions? Earlier, Pam asked if you had a favorite piece. So I'll just ask you that question. Well, it's it's sort of like you're asking, do you have a favorite child? You know, um, I have feelings about all of them. Um, but I think the first one that I made, the round circle that I said was my first piece that got into it, uh, a juried exhibition, that's really important because I never thought that I was an artist. I just always thought I was a librarian or um, or a cook or a mom or a whatever. I, I didn't know that I could do that. So that was very affirming. Um, I really love that little horse that we showed you from the clay prints, uh, the one that... Uh, I feel like that's really me because I was able to put the the uh, visual art and the two dimensional art with my sewing. I started sewing when I was nine years old, and uh, and I was in four H. So that's something that is in me. Um, should we show them these? Um, I also love to paint, and I've been doing a lot of painting uh, during this period. I'm going to pick up what and show you. Um, whoops, that's there. Yeah, that was this is a watercolor and acrylic on a canvas, big tulips. And I was practicing to see if I could, uh, what I could do with all the runny, oozy, juicy colors in the, in the, um, um, what else do I have? This is another one that I've been working on. Uh, this is a, this is an old floral that I um, went back in and put a lot of texture in it and a lot of other colors. So I do like the painting. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, do I have any other? Um, I've got two really giant paintings. And what I've found out is that I love painting big. And maybe that's also why I love uh, the idea of the big clay prints. Yeah, I have small ones too. I have some that are just eight by 10 inches, but I really like the big um, physicality of making these. And we're going to walk over it and I'm going to show you these paintings. Okay, I'm gonna, I have two paintings here that are five feet by four feet, and they're both landscapes. And if anybody has room, contact me later. Um, this one is called Long Gone. And I don't know how much detail you can see from the screen, but it's an old abandoned coal camp. And it's something we see whenever we take a, a drive in the country, isn't it? This is what used to be here in West Virginia, the old coal camps. And this one is the Ohio River. And it's the steam, Sean, can you hear me? It's the steam coming up from uh, the Ohio River with yeah, the ridge behind it. You can hear me all right? 
Yeah. I'm going to step the, out of the way. Yeah. Okay. So I was really pleased with this. I like, like I said, making the big ones. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, somebody from way out in Wisconsin thought this was fascinating. Thanks. That's really, that's really good to know you're there. And of course, this is the person who uh, helped save my life uh, by introducing me to, to uh, reintroducing me to quilters, Carolyn, and, uh, and the, uh, reintroducing me to the joys of all those beautiful colors in a fabric shop. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah. How are we doing on time, Sean? Um, I, we're up uh, over 50 minutes, so it's fine. Uh, okay. I want to see if anyone else has a question before we let you go, but I, th I hope people understand that the, this is kind of new, especially when we go on the road like this, but I think overall uh, it was quite nice. Uh, we got to see a lot of uh, beautiful art. Um, so I apologize for any technical problems. We're still working on that, but uh, Carol wanted to say this. Uh, thank you, Carol. And lots of compliments. Uh, well, Carolyn Ziegler was uh, one of my first quilt instructors. Oh, it was always, so it was great to find, to find her again in the library. Carolyn has a question now. Okie doke. Let's see, what's your favorite medium or color? What's my favorite color? Uh, that's, again, that's kind of like, which one's my favorite kid? I like bright colors. So let me show you a quilt. I'll bring it over. So, so we don't have to have a bumpy ride over to the quilt. And uh, Carolyn, you can see some of my favorite colors here. So I like my colors. And this is a, a fused quilt. These are all hand dyed fabrics, and then they've been fused onto or fused together and then quilted all the there. Um, I love it. I'm not quite at it. This is a modern version of the courthouse steps. Turn turn toward chair a little bit. Please. Here I am. Okay. Courthouse steps is a traditional pattern in the quilt making world, just like the uh, uh, log cabin was. But so this doesn't look anything like courthouse steps, but kind of sort of it does. Yeah. Thank you so much for for uh, having me at the lunch with books, and uh, thank you for putting up with finding a wireless signal in the basement. Uh, I thought it was great. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, everyone's enjoyed it. The compliments are just flowing, and I'll, I'll let you read them. You can you can see everything on our Facebook page. Um, there was one other question that I'll put up, and that'll be the last question for you, because I know you okay. can't. I know your answer to this one. Oh no, I don't illustrate children's books. Uh, I've written them, uh, and that's because Elizabeth, uh, writing a, illustrating a children's book. The illustration is a completely different uh, art form. And so, um, for example, an editor of a children's uh, book publishing house would want to see a portfolio of my artwork in which, um, for example, I might have a lot of frogs to show them that I could do frog and toad are friends. Um, but the frogs wouldn't just be stationary frogs. They'd have to have a personality. They'd have to have movement. I'd have to be able to show them that I could do, not exactly animation, but I would be able to, each page could be a different, uh, him walking, him jumping, him, something like that. I 
come to art making late in life. And I don't have a drawing background. I have a uh, sewing and um, uh, like a fiber graphic background. So I see my art in flat. And that's why the, the uh, quilting suits me. That's why the um, printmaking suits me. And you notice those big tulips I made? They're pretty flat. They weren't really um, a real tulip. So I love the art in children's books. That was my career for the first uh, half of my career in the library world was working with children's books and illustrators and authors. Uh, so, um, boy, wouldn't it be great to be able to do that? But it takes a lot of, uh, I'd have to start now. Maybe by the time I was 100, I'd be ready to uh, make one. Uh, yeah, you should do more art classes, Sean. That, it's always fun to watch people. It's always fun to watch paint dry, isn't it? Somebody else's paint dry. <laughs> I think we will do more. We're, you know, we're learning as we go. And I think that uh, the people are raving about this. So, and, and, and Chuck Wood said, here, I'm going to put it up because it's a compliment about uh, the program. So, oh, oh, yeah, this is great. I loved having people in my basement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, did, I did. Great. I did. In my basement. Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you, Cheryl. That was excellent, and we really enjoyed it. And thank you for, for being a good sport and doing that for us. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming to my studio. Anytime. Now it's back. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for attending today. And this Thursday, we have our final People's University, The Struggle for Women's Rights at 630 on Modern Issues. And we're going to have a tribute to uh, Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So don't miss that on Thursday at 630. Thanks again, Cheryl. Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming.